we look at all of the faults and figure out, uh, you know, look at the seismic gap and um, look at the probability of earthquakes happening, we can come up with a forecast map of earthquakes. And this is the uh, California um, earthquake forecast map. And you can see on here, this is the 30-year likelihood, so there's your probability, of a magnitude 6.7 or greater earthquake happening. And um, this, uh, you can see on here, it, the reason that 30 years is picked is that's the typical duration of a home mortgage. So it's kind of for insurance purposes. And so it's the probability of an earthquake of uh, a large magnitude happening within the next 30 years. And the reddest parts, that's the most likely place for earthquakes to happen. And then it gets less and less probable as we go to the blue ones. So if you live anywhere along this line, um, get earthquake insurance. That would be my advice uh, because the probability is high that you will, will have an earthquake there. Uh, so that's the best we can do these days. Um, we're better at forecasting the weather than earthquakes at this point in time. But I always say, um, you know, my lectures change every year as new, um, new information uh, shows up and as new research is done. So who knows, one of these days I might be talking about better and new ways of forecasting earthquakes. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, for some reason psychics forecasting earthquakes get a lot of media attention, or at least sometimes they do. I remember when I lived in Chicago back in like the late 80s, um, there was this guy who was convinced there was going to be a giant earthquake in San, uh, St. Louis. Uh, and I think it was like in August of 1989 and he was on the news a lot and like everyone was buying canned goods and toilet paper in Illinois because he, this this like dude claimed that he knew what was going on and so please don't listen to the psychics, listen to the scientists um, and when we, it comes to earthquake forecasting. All right, so what about an early warning system of earthquakes? Some places have these and um, uh, what happens with earthquake early warning systems? Remember the primary wave travels very fast and the surface waves travel a lot slower. And the surface waves are some of the ones that cause the most damage. And these surface waves travel about four kilometers a second. So that says it's going to take about 25 seconds for the most damaging earthquake waves to reach a point 100 kilometers away. That means you'd have 25 seconds to prepare for an earthquake. Now that doesn't sound like a lot of time, but it actually is. Because in 25 seconds, you could be like, well, my, my front door is right over there. And I've been saying the um, safest place to be is where nothing can fall on you. I could be like, oh, in 25 seconds, I can be out the front door and in the middle of the road where nothing can fall on me. Or if I'm in a house 20, that I can't get outside right away, 25 seconds is enough time to get to a safer place. It's time in Japan to shut down the bullet train so it's not like flying off the tracks at, what is it, 300 miles an hour or whatever it goes at. So it does, while it, it can't forecast an earthquake happening days out, the minute an earthquake occurs, it can let the people in the area that are going to be affected, um, it provides them just a little bit of time to get ready at, to uh, better survive the earthquake. This has been used in Japan since 2007. In California, testing began in 2012, and then funding got pulled, and then testing began again, and then funding got pulled. And uh, this has been, California has been testing for something like 30 years now, but it's like it always sort of starts and then people cut the funding, and so I have no idea what's going on now. Other places that have earthquake early warning systems are parts of Mexico and um, Romania, interestingly. 
So how are you going to survive an earthquake? What's the best way to survive? Well, first of all, if you move to a place where earthquakes are likely to happen, be prepared for one. If any of you guys decide to move to California, just get it in your brain that someday I am going to be in an earthquake and I should be ready for it. Um, how should you be ready for it? Here are some, some suggestions of like making your house better to survive an earthquake. And some of these are fairly logical things like secure top heavy furniture to the wall studs so they don't fall over on you. Um, don't hang heavy things above your bed to fall on your face if an earthquake happens in the night. Keep a fire extinguisher nearby. That's just a good idea in any house. Uh, but anyway, that's some things you can do to try to um, uh, make your house better in an earthquake. Don't panic. Panic is never the solution. Um, so when, when the ground starts shaking, just realize, all right, it's an earthquake. I'm, I'm ready for this. I know what to do. If you're inside, get under some sort of steady or sturdy furniture and hold on because the biggest thing that kills people is stuff falling on them and uh, you know cracking their heads open and stuff so you want to get under something sturdy if you're outside stay away from anything that can fall on you if you're driving stop the car away from things that can fall on you and by the way don't cross bridges or overpasses because earthquakes can significantly damage those and you don't want to start driving on one that might collapse um, okay, the old wives' tale of get in a doorway. Um, that's not true. And I have this whole long quote here from the United States Geological Survey, why it's not true. Um, so in adobe homes and masonry structures, oftentimes the only thing left standing was a doorway. And so people are like, ah, doors are, are better places to be. But in modern houses, they are no stronger than any other part of the house. And in fact, you're more likely to break your fingers when the door slams shut on them. Uh, so don't get in the doorway. Follow the United States Geological Survey's advice of uh, drop, cover, and hold. Basically get under something sturdy and uh, hold on until the ground stops shaking. All right, this is your random picture of the day. Uh, this is on the road to um, uh, Hammerfest, Norway. That's where my grandfather used to work. There's this big long tunnel that you drive through to get to this island um, where Hammerfest is. And uh, what the warning sign says, that's reindeer, and this says in the tunnel. And it's because reindeer aren't stupid. And when the weather gets bad, the reindeer are like, why should I stay out here in rain and snow and sleet and crappy weather when I can go in this big long tunnel and be nice and warm and dry? And so they had a warm driver so they don't drive into this like giant herd of reindeer that likes to hang out in the tunnel. Uh, so what I want to finish the uh, lecture with now is a quick case study, a quick look at an earthquake that happened in the past, what happened, and what did we learn from it. And I chose the Mexico City earthquake of 1985. And here's just some of the basic information of it. It happened in September. It was a magnitude 8 earthquake. The maximum Mercalli intensity felt was a nine. So if you wanna know what that means, you can go to the Mercalli scale in the lecture and uh, take a look at what the people would have felt. The rupture length, that means the length of the fault where movement occurred was 200 kilometers. And the amount of movement was about 2.3 meters. And remember one meter is about like this. So those rocks moved a significant amount. The epicenter was actually 350 kilometers away from Mexico City, but you're going to see why people remember it as the Mexico City earthquake. Now, this earthquake occurred on a subduction zone where the Cocos plate is sinking underneath the North American plate. And what happened in Mexico City was absolutely terrible because um, and it's remembered as the Mexico City earthquake because they had the most damage there. And what we're looking at here, this is a building that completely collapsed. Each one of these layers you see was a story in the building. So this was probably at least one, two, three, four, five. It was at least six stories, maybe more, and it just pancaked shut. 
Um, and that's uh, really why people remember this earthquake quite a bit. And the reason the damage was worse in Mexico City comes down to the local geology. It's built on the sediments of ancient Lake Texcoco. And these lake sediments are muds that have a lot of water in them. And so you had a lot of liquefaction. And remember how those bay muds in San Francisco amplified the earthquake waves? Same thing happened in the lake sediments that Mexico City sits on. And uh, what made it even worse is in this earthquake, the seismic waves were one to two second frequency. That's how often a crest of the earthquake wave passed by. The lake sediments happened to amplify that exact frequency of waves. And then buildings six to 16, that should say stories high, vibrate, remember I said buildings sway, they vibrate at a one to two second frequency. So you had all of these things basically amplifying the earthquake and together they cause resonance, which means where the, the initial earthquake waves might have been just a little bit, all of them amplified each other and made everything so much worse. And so it really just came down to the local geology and the frequency of those earthquake waves. And unfortunately, in this event, around 9,500 people died and over 30,000 were injured. And you can see a lot of buildings were completely damaged um, and destroyed. There were landslides in areas and sand blows and ground cracks. There was a, a localized tsunami with a wave height of three meters on the west coast of Mexico. And then there's these things called seiches. And we'll talk about what that is. It's basically this wave that kind of washes back and forth in like a swimming pool or a bay or a lake. And some of those were even noticed here in Texas, which is fascinating because you can have this earthquake hundreds of miles away, but the earthquake waves still have a little influence on what's going on here. All right, but I do want to say there is some good news about this. Uh, so in Mexico, they decided that the earth, they wanted an earthquake early warning system. They did not want this to happen again. And so in 89, they started developing it, completed in 1991, and this worked successfully for a magnitude 7.4 earthquake that hit Mexico City in 2012. And the warning system was expanding to other parts of Mexico. I don't know how much of the country it covers at this point. But so that is something where a tragedy, they used the science that was learned in that to uh, develop something hopefully that can save lives in the future.